there's something affecting every aspect of our health that very few people think about. And that is our mitochondria. It turns out that keeping our mitochondria healthy can be game-changing for our longevity and help us prevent diseases from cancer to diabetes. We interviewed Dr. Nick Verhoeven, creator of Physionic, to find out more about mitochondrial health and how to improve it. He also shared what supplements to take, unique exercise advice like how to use mini heart attacks to improve heart health, and other tips on how to slow aging. Dr. Nick has a PhD in molecular medicine and a master's in exercise physiology. His YouTube channel breaks down complex medical studies, helping viewers learn about their body. I'm gonna walk you through a number of analyses on how vitamin D supplementation affects your bone health. And I think you'll be a little surprised by the results. You research what feels like thousands of topics, but there's one that you specialize in, it seems, and that's mitochondrial health. What got you interested in it? Kind of happenstance, honestly. So I'd gotten my initial degree in psychology and then uh, I went back to school because I was so interested in science. When I went back to school, I was really interested in muscle physiology. So I ended up contacting some of the researchers there that do muscle physiology work, uh, specifically metabolism. They were doing a lot of mitochondrial work, so that's how I fell into it. And then I did that for my master's and did that for my PhD. So here we are talking about mitochondria. And why is it so important? Oh, wow. <laughs> Why is it so important? You're asking a researcher to, to discuss what they study and why it's important. They could go on forever. There's all kinds of different ways that it's important. You can say from the powerhouse of the cell, which everyone loves to, to say. And the second thing would be that it keeps your cells from becoming cancerous because it leads to what's called mitochondrial mediated apoptosis, so the cell death. It controls cell signaling, so it releases different molecules. But on the high level, it's implicated in diabetes. It's in, implicating cardiovascular disease, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis. Almost every single disease has some link to mitochondria. Now, I don't want to necessarily say mitochondria are the cause for all those diseases, but there's definitely a link. So it's extremely important for all those reasons. Hmm. And how do people improve it? Or also, how do you even measure it? Ooh, measuring mitochondria can be a difficult task, mainly because researchers, what they do is they usually measure, for example, oxygen consumption. So when we consume oxygen and it gets delivered to our tissues, it's actually our mitochondria that end up taking up that oxygen and with the help of nutrients, end up producing cellular energy, the powerhouse of the cell again. If you have mitochondria that are using up this oxygen, researchers can then isolate those mitochondria and measure the amount of oxygen consumption. Now, it's a little more difficult to do in kind of day-to-day -day basis. Like if a person wanted to get a mitochondrial measure, they could get mitochondrial measures, but it's typically about the proteins or the genes and stuff like that. So it doesn't actually speak to the mitochondrial function. One thing that people can do is measure what's called VO2. And VO2 isn't like a one-to-one -one proxy to mitochondria, but because they have such a tight link to oxygen consumption, if your VO2 is higher, typically your mitochondria will be healthier and, and better functioning. So yeah, you can improve it through exercise, for example, and you can measure it through VO2. And what are some other things about mitochondrial health that nobody really knows but you? Well, I definitely, somebody on earth definitely knows something way more than I do in every single thing when it comes to mitochondrial health and whatnot. It's the most interesting for me is the fact that it protects us from cancer. It's not necessarily unknown knowledge, but most people think of the powerhouse of the cell again. So when they focus so much on that, they kind of lose sight of all the different other things that mitochondria do. And the fact that mitochondria have this amazing ability to protect us from these cells that start to overgrow and start to become out of control like they do in cancer. Mitochondria just essentially explode themselves inside of our cells so that it forces the cell to die. And it's this incredible mechanism that really just saves us from disease on a daily basis, especially in different tissues. You think of like epithelial cells and your intestinal lining and whatnot. There's a constant turnover there. Meanwhile, you have to have mitochondria that are incredibly robust when it comes to muscle cells because you can't just replicate more muscle cells. So the big takeaway here is that mitochondria are constantly protecting you. They're not just giving you function, they're protecting you from any sort of disease through 
their own self-sacrifice, if you want to say it that way. They're martyrs for us. Yeah, they are martyrs, mitochondrial martyrs, absolutely. That, that's catchy. <laughs> yeah. Them preventing cancer, is this like a causal link or just an association? It's definitely causal. I mean, there's many mechanisms that our cells protect us from cancer, but one of the mechanisms is an extrinsic factor, as in you have immune cells and different cells that will connect up to a cell that's starting to become cancerous and will essentially tell it, hey, you need to kill yourself. And in that situation, the cell will start to produce these different proteins called caspases that'll start attacking all the different functional proteins and start destroying them. Now, on top of that, it starts to produce these DNases, which are these proteins that go into the nucleus and basically sabotage all the nuclear material that's in there. So if you don't have any genes, if you don't have any blueprint to make any more proteins, the cell just be destabilizes and dies. Now, the second mechanism is through mitochondria. So if for some reason that system didn't work, these immune cells attach and tell the cell, hey, you gotta, you gotta die off because you're starting to become cancerous, then mitochondria can jump in and start to release these different factors and essentially blow open to the point where the cell energy of the, the cell just drops to such a precipitous level that the cell ends up going through this apoptosis. It's just an unbelievable process and it's definitely caused it. If you kill off mitochondria, especially through these mechanisms, and we can force that to happen through specific proteins, then absolutely it always causes cell death and to cancer cells. I'm guessing just like many other parts of our body, our mitochondrial function will tend to decline with time and senescence and so forth. Exercise will help slow how much the decline is. Are there any other really good ways? Yeah, so exercise is probably the most potent, but there are ways that you can preserve your mitochondrial function. And one of the simplest ways is really just caloric restriction, making sure that you're not over consuming on a regular basis. And that really just comes down to like weight gain, weight loss, things of that nature. And there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on these other areas. But some other areas that we can look into is like different types of fats, for example. So palmitate, which is a type of saturated fat and is the most common saturated fat found in foods and whatnot, that one, when you expose mitochondria to palmitate, it can cause all kinds of damage. I mean, oxidative stress, the mitochondria will end up dying off. Sometimes the cell will end up dying off if enough of those mitochondria die. On the other hand, if you apply like unsaturated fats, Keep in mind, this is all cell work, so you know, trying to extrapolate that up to like a human level is, is a lot more difficult to do, especially since I mentioned that measuring mitochondria is a difficult thing. But when you apply the same level, same amounts of unsaturated fats that you did with like palmitate, talking about something like oleate or oleic acid, then you don't see these effects and you tend to see improvements or at least a maintenance of mitochondrial health. So, there's exercise, there's the amount that you consume. Those are the two probably greatest levers. And then on top of that is the types of foods that we consume. I think there, there's a ton of research that still needs to be done to exactly figure out what is gonna have the greatest effect, you know, positive or negative. All right, and you know, we're kind of a nutrition focused channel. Oh, so, okay. yeah, who figured? <laughs> so the types of food could affect your mitochondrial health. Are you able to say what types of food are best for the health? I'm not sure. That's where, honestly, I would get really speculative. My impression is that, and I have to be clear, it's an impression, it's not based on mounds of human trials, or it's not like you're gonna get much associative data on mitochondria and food and whatnot. But I would say probably a reduction in saturated fat, which is a common theme for a lot of different, you know, if it comes to insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, I would say a reduction in saturated fat just, and that's based off of these cell studies where they do apply. Again, the key thing is that every variable is the same. You're only changing the type of fat. The amount of fat is the exact same, just the type of fat is different. And suddenly mitochondria have these strong reactions. You can see it under the microscope. The mitochondria will go from this elongated shape to really miniature where they start just producing so much oxidative stress that ultimately stresses the cell and can lead the cell to die off potentially prematurely. So saturated fat would probably be a no-go, just reducing that. Unsaturated fats is probably the way one would want to go. I think carbohydrates, glucose is probably fine, depending, again, probably on the, the type of carbohydrate you're consuming. But once you're trying to translate, again, those human variables of one's nutrition to 
what's happening, not just for one cell or a grouping of cells, but within a single cell, it just gets so difficult. And that's why I say like, there's so much more research that needs to be done on the types of foods and whatnot. But I think the components of certain foods, think of like polyphenols and whatnot that you might get from, let's say, plant-based foods. I think those would probably have a, a tremendous impact at protecting mitochondria and protecting the cell as a whole. I see. And what about supplements? People love to actual supplements. Mm. And I know you have some videos, a lot of creatine, for example. Yeah. What would you say that people should be taking in general? Man, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've told Chris this before that, or in a comment under your video, Viva Longevity, is that I'm in this kind of tricky position where I cover a lot of supplement material and science and whatnot. And there's some fascinating science related to that as well. But when it comes to like actual advice that people should follow or just how they should structure their lives, supplements are at the bottom of the list. I just want to make it clear that just because a lot of the content that I release, which I'm trying to put a little bit more of kind of the generalized content like exercise, nutrition, supplements is just on the lower list. But let's just assume in a situation a person has taken care of exercise and they have a pretty good nutrition where, you know, they're not gaining a bunch of weight. They're eating a relatively well-balanced diet in just kind of a standard scenario. Now, on top of that, if you came to supplements, as you mentioned, creatine has over a thousand studies behind it. It's the most researched supplement. It's an incredible molecule that affects our brain. It affects our musculature. And people often ask, well, if I'm not exercising, should I be taking creatine? The answer is absolutely. Creatine has a tremendous effect on our brain, even though we don't exercise, and especially for people over the age of 65, it's starting to really come out. There's also evidence in younger individuals. So creatine is a big one. There's pretty good evidence for omega-3s as well. It doesn't have to be, it could be fish oil, it could be algal oil, however you pronounce that. Just the source has to be omega-3s, a delicate balance of EPA and DHA, which are two versions of these omega-3s. They affect our brain, they affect our cardiovascular health, and they probably affect a whole host of other areas that just haven't been discovered. So I would say those two, and then if a person doesn't have a strong plant-based nutrition, Lutein and zeaxanthin are fantastic for the eyes and the brain. So those have robust evidence behind them. And, and a lot of eye doctors mentioned those to a significant degree just because they have such a great effect on our eyes and our eye health. But I think there's some research looking at lutein on the brain as well. So if you wanted to restrict it to one supplement, I would say creatine. If you wanted to restrict it to, let's say, a top three, I would probably go, well, I guess three or four because lutein and zeaxanthin kind of get combined together. I would stick to those right now because I'm continuing to do research as I read more and more into the literature and I try to discover which ways different supplements can have a positive impact. And it also depends on circumstance. Like some people are eating enough fish so they don't need to be consuming more omega-3s or a person may be suffering from diabetes and then maybe another supplement might be that additive that could help them more than something like creatine or whatever it might be. It's very circumstance driven, but that's why I tried to create the standard scenario. And then all is a hot topic is exercise. Everyone has an opinion on it. What do you have to say that is unique in the field? Because we all hear much of the same old, same old. Yeah, you know, we were talking a little bit off air about the content that gets put out there about topics in general. And a lot of it is repetition. And there's nothing wrong with repetition. As a matter of fact, if you can just create these slight tweaks in how a person says something, sometimes it can really click for someone, which is fantastic. On the other hand, there's so much research out there. It's just an incredible sea of literature that covers all these different mechanisms of how, again, I'm just focusing on exercise, but you could pick any one of these different categories that you want to talk about. If that's nutrition, sleep, whatever. There are just so many mechanisms and so many interesting pieces of information. So related to exercise, I would say one piece of information I recently stumbled across is this idea of cardiac preconditioning. In my video, I've got a kind of inflammatory title. You know where those clickbaity titles. Yeah, I, I know this. <laughs> Calling you out. <laughs> but I will say, I always deliver. The title may be something, but I actually say, yeah. you know, I, I give reasoning for yeah. why I gave that. Um, and in this situation, it's like these mini heart attacks that happen around your cardiac muscle. And one of the ways that, that that can be done is, well, one is actually pharmacologically. Another one is through actual physical clamping of the muscle, which obviously nobody's ever going to do. And then another way is exercise. Exercise has a way of leading to this mini heart attack. And I just want to be sure that everybody knows that's in quotations because it's just emulating a heart attack, but it's not actually causing a heart attack. That emulation, that mini heart attack protects against a real heart attack if 
a one were to occur. And there's research linking that phenomenon to people that exercise that have a more robust ability to recover from heart attacks where they have no heart damage if they have a heart attack. I mean, it's things like that are just mind boggling, They're just so incredible. Beyond that, I mean, you know, if you talk about resistance training, there's different mechanisms by which we can encourage muscle growth, if that's metabolic, if that's mechanical tension, if that's muscle damage, like there's all kinds of inflammatory mechanism. It's just a lot there that I wish that we could drill into so much more. And like each one of those topics would be like an hour long conversation. Well, luckily you have your channel. We can post about all those. So check out Physionic. You almost feel like a future Michael Greger to me because you go through all <laughs> this research, except you don't have the super plant bias. So what are your sources that you refer to to make your videos? What journals do you tend to trust the most? websites you like? So I actually don't use websites almost at all. I only use journals. If you go to a journal, almost all of them will have an alert. You can click on alert and then just put in your email address and then they'll send you all the most current issues for that week. I think I've subscribed to probably 50 different journals. So they all get sent to my email inbox and I just scour through those. Or with the use of AI, you can also pull together research from there. And I try not to rely too much on a single study. And I look at a single study and then I start using the key words in that study to try to find and fill in some of the information. So I make sure that there's some level of consistency in the data. Sometimes it's unavoidable just because there are gonna be studies that are kind of cutting edge and things might end up deviating from that study in the future. But usually I try to, to pull together as many studies or scientific reviews. I try to rely on meta-analyses, especially a big one is the Cochrane Review, focusing on research methods that they publish because they're kind of the gold standard. And they have these very strict guidelines that they want researchers to go by. And you can go to any one of their reviews and you can see they won't publish anything unless it follows these exact guidelines. And they're pretty strict by comparison to other meta-analyses. So it gives you an indication of, okay, if they do that, I should start trying to apply that to other studies. And once you do that, you get a pretty good idea of what the research says. And what are your goals for Physionic? Honestly, just to continue what I'm doing. I get obsessed with learning. So selfishly, I'd like to learn at the fastest rate I possibly can. So I'll say from a selfish perspective, that's one huge driver that I just want to learn as much as possible. The second thing is that I just want to grow the channel and help people as much as possible. I also want to make sure that people feel like I'm representing their circumstances as best as I can. And the other main thing that I really want to put out there is to go deeper into topics as opposed to just having this kind of peripheral, you should use this nutrition because it helps against cardiovascular disease. Well, I want to understand, well, what are the mechanisms? Why does it do that? What percentages of that nutrient? Like there's so many questions that are related that you can constantly go deeper and deeper and deeper into. And that's where I get so obsessed with it. That's where I think I can bring in some added nuance that is just interesting and people feel connected to their body. I mean, one of the main mantras for Physionic was learn your body. And that, that I really still hold that. I, I want people to understand the clinical evidence, which is where they should base their interpretation of how they go about things on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I'd like for people to understand why is the clinical evidence the way that it is? Once we dive into the mechanisms, what's happening inside their body, inside their cells and the cardiac cells and how they're different from fibroblasts and renal cells. And you're just going through the entire system and it's just this unbelievably adaptive system that like blows our mind. Those are the motivations and that's really just what I'm trying to continue to drive forward for phys Physionic. You're a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I know I am. No, I love it. We're all nerds I here. <laughs> Was there anything I didn't ask about that you want to share? I mean, like you said, I'm a nerd. So, I mean, there's trillions of things that I could talk about. So I think constraining me to the topics that I get to discuss is a good way to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank thanks for having me. I've been dying to, to do this. I mean, I, I think I told you, I, I've been watching you guys for such a long time. I don't know when it was that you guys were at like 20,000 subscribers, but it's been a few years. I'll say that much. And you guys, so you guys have three different angles you guys aim so for? So one is you, one is me, one is both of us. And we'll oh, cut okay. between okay, those gotcha. three shots. And I often do four, but I'm being less obsessive today. <laughs> oh. What's the fourth one usually? Uh, it's like a kind of side angle of you. So we have two uh, different close-ups of the speaker. Okay, okay. It's the one where I zoom in on your biceps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh my God.